A Brief History of the Universe. Here's the Big Bang. <laughs> you need worse to trigger conservatives. So here's the Big Bang, guys. Take a look at the Big Bang. The Big Boom. It's too big. <laughs> okay. Take a look at the Big Boom, guys. There it is. The Big Bang is the end of our understanding of the current universe. If you go back far in time, you see that all the matter in space was condensed into a tiny volume. Very hot. As you can imagine, it's very hot, very dense. We're talking billions of degrees, millions of degrees, okay? It was so hot, the universe, remember, the entire universe was super hot at this moment. So at this time, the entire universe was compressed into a volume the size of a grapefruit. And as you can imagine, the temperatures are extremely hot. All the forces of nature were combined into a super force. Gravity, the nuclear force, the weak force, the strong forces. They were all compressed into a super force, which we still don't really understand. But that's what physics says and shows us. And after that, there is a rapid inflation. Dark energy was the dominant force in the universe. It was stretching apart the universe. Dark energy. And um, dark energy is like gravity's evil twin. Right? Gravity wants to pull things together. Dark energy wants to pull them apart, rip them apart. And this energy is embedded within space-time itself, driving the expansion of the universe. So as the universe began to expand, it cooled down. It was able to cool down. And the fundamental forces in nature were able to now separate into the different, the different uh, forces. Um... And a lot of that matter condensed, began to precipitate from this primordial energy state, like much like clouds, like rain and clouds. That's where matter comes from. Matter comes from that original energy, primordial energy. It was a quark gluon plasma. It wasn't matter in atoms that we know today. It was a different state of matter called a quark gluon plasma. And um, so for the first three minutes of the universe, the first nuclei were be, are able to actually form. As the universe cooled down, these quark gluon, the quarks and gluon particles were able to coalesce, turn into nuclei, and these nuclei were now able to combine with protons and form the first atoms, hydrogen and helium. These, uh, yes, dark energy is more powerful than gravity. On a universal level. Um, at this moment, moment the, the light that the universe was just beginning to be produced. And this is what we see when we look at the CMB radiation, the cosmic microwave background radiation is uh, with something we can observe. How do we know what happened? This is all physics, right? We have physicists dedicated to understanding how this all occurred. Um, it's just mathematics and physics. So the Dark Ages were the, for the first 400,000 years of the universe's history to the first 100 million years, there was no light that was being produced by stars. There were no stars. The universe was mostly dark, just light moving through the universe, never able to ref reflect or interact with anything until about 150 million years after the Big Bang, when dark matter began to clump matter together matter that was newly formed this dark matter was able to clump them together and form the first galaxies 
So, these first stars formed, and now we have fusion. The first stars that formed fusion were able to now form heavier elements in their cores. The first, you know, carbon atoms, oxygen atoms, the things that make us you, make up you and me. And in fact, so actually the matter that makes up you and me are actually, is actually very, very rare. Only 5% of matter is visible matter. 27% of the matter in the universe is dark matter. And 68% of the matter, uh, the stuff in the universe is dark energy. So it turns out that we are just a fraction of what's out there, okay? Um, so, now we have dark matter seeding the first galaxy forma formation. Galaxies begin to form. Angular momentum allows them to be form disks, which then produce a lot of stars around it, planetary systems. This is kind of what it was like. It's incredible that these galaxies were able to form out of stars and things like that. Clumps of matter. It took billions of years. This took millions and millions and millions of years of slow changes, physic, physic, physical changes. And some of the first stars finally began to explode and become supernovae, right? And enrich the rest of the solar systems around them, the star systems around them. And all that material, enriched with all that amazing, rich material, uh, was able to then become newly formed planetary systems that allow for life, okay? So about seven or eight billion years ago, uh, or five billion years ago, life was really able to form in our galaxy, our specific galaxy. There's enough material there for that to happen. And now we know because of, so now we're going back to our star, right? The sun. This is how the sun formed. There is a cloud, a material that collapsed due to gravity and formed a planetary disk, much like a, this is what it was like. This, this planetary disk is how our solar system first formed. Because of angular momentum, like a skater spinning on their, you know, uh, their shoes and on the ice, they actually are able to spin. And when they move their arms closer to their bodies, they spin faster and faster. The same happens to things in space. The same physics applies to planetary disks. And all that matter was clumping up in the center, spinning the disk faster, and uh, forming a planetary system. That's how it was like. This is what it looks like. All that gas and dust, all that enriched material from stars exploding, mixed into this planetary disk. And some of that material, a lot, of, most of that material became the star, the sun, right? Because that's where all the mass collected in the center. And because there was so much pressure and heat built up because of all that mass, it was super hot in the sun's core. And what happens when you have super hot stuff? Light, nuclear fusion begins. Atoms smash together so quickly that light emerges. And that's nuclear fusion. This is what Einstein's equations show. So now we have a star. And a young star wants to ignite. And it wants to produce shock waves. Shock waves that push out that material outwards. And what happens? It becomes colder. As it moves away from the hot star, it gets colder. So fragments of ice and rocks clump together, condensate outside of the solar system, on the outskirts of it. And this is what happens and forms planets. These planets are just clumps of rocks sticking together. And in space, rocks, there's something called cold welding that allows metals to clump together without any any glue. It's just it's just a physical force that, that occurs that makes these rocks collect together. And that's how planets are formed. This is how it is. So once you have enough of this matter, you have a planet, a protoplanet, like Earth. This is here we are. About 4 billion years ago, 4.5 billion years ago, the Earth was a molten rock. 
was super hot. There was no solid surface. It was molten. It was literally like molten. It wasn't even solid yet because it was super hot. We're talking thousands of degrees, right? So as the solar system became more stable, as there was less and less bombardment over millions of years, as the orbits became more stable, less and less rocks made it to the Earth and it was able to cool down. The Earth was now able to finally cool down and form that surface, that solid surface, okay? And about 4.4 billion years ago, you finally have a rocky planet with a solid surface, but then what happens about 4.4 billion years ago? A planet the size of Mars smashes into the Earth and produces the moon. That's sick. This really happened. This is exactly how it happened, right? There is a planet the size of Mars that smashed into the Earth and formed the moon. A lot of that ejecta went out into space and became the moon. The moon we know today, that little clump of material you see floating around there, that's the moon. And over time, we have this Earth-Moon system, okay? Now, a lot of these asteroids in the early solar system contained water. They contained lots of water locked in. See, this is, these are called chondrites, carbonaceous chondrites. They're full of carbon. They're full of water. There's water locked in, in the, and they're, they're called hydrates inside of these rocks. And what happens is they're in ice form. And then when they hit the earth, what happens? It melts and it becomes water vapor. Okay. So now the Earth is being bombarded by all these rocks and material with water and amino acids. Some of the first amino acids were introduced by other meteorites, okay? So now we have oceans because it starts to rain. Look at all that water. Look at all that gas and clouds in the atmosphere of the Earth, right? This is the early solar, the early Earth. Uh, we, okay, we have oceans form, right? A lot of that, a lot of that uh, asteroids bombard the Earth can you guys hear me now? Okay. A lot of those... Uh, I hit the button by accident. A lot of the um, rocks contain water in them. And as the Earth was being bombarded by these chondrites full of water, they formed the first clouds. There was lots of clouds, lots of precipitation, the first oceans. Okay? So now in the oceans, we have amino acids that come from space and water. And... Uh, in the early oceans, we have lots of heat from the early from the core of the Earth. Okay, so there's something called uh, hydrothermal vents. There's also there's also uh, radioactive decay happening in the in the deep core of the Earth or the, the deep mantle of the Earth, which fuels the energy to produce the first protocells, the first life, abiogenesis. These amino acids can clump together, interact with each other chemically, and form amyloids, the firm form proto-living beings, which are able to replicate over time, over a chemical evolution. Now we have the first life. The first life forms about 4 billion years ago on the Earth's uh, surface. And cyanobacteria, this is bacteria that loves to uh, suck in that carbon dioxide. They love, to, they love to use the sunlight, carbon dioxide, to make oxygen, okay? Remember, there was no oxygen on the earth yet until bacteria started to burp and fart. <laughs> and all those farts went out into the earth's atmosphere and became oxygen, right? That we now breathe. <laughs> so you're breathing bacteria farts from these first microbes 4 billion years ago, okay? Most of the oxygen you're breathing comes from those microbes 4 billion years ago. A lot of it's recycled so as well today, but most of it comes from those bacteria. So now we have an ozone layer, right? Because with oxygen, now in the atmosphere, when it interacts with certain light rays, it actually produces ozone. And ozone forms a protective shield around the Earth that protects it from, from cosmic rays and sun rays that can potentially damage us. Okay, so also 
the oceans are now able to be saturated with oxygen. Because all think of all that oxygen being produced in the oceans. Okay, now the oceans are able to be saturated with oxygen. Okay. Oxygen is incredibly important for metabolism in animals. So it was highly important for those first microbes to release oxygen. If that didn't happen, we wouldn't be here today. So now we have the beginnings of evolution. 600 million years ago, the first animals arose in the oceans, the first fish. Then 300 million years ago, Tiktaalik, the first amphibious creatures able to finally walk onto land. Okay. Um, remember, this is over millions and millions of years of evolutionary processes, right? It's not like one day a fish grew legs and walked on land. No, there's a, there was a, um, a very gradual process involved here. But the point is, this is a very sped up process. But this is how we walked on land. The trees began to emerge about 300 million years ago. Okay, There were no trees yet before 300 million years ago. Okay. So this was one of the first land animals, right? They're amphibious. They, wore, they lived on half land and half water. Okay? They were able to survive on land. They pushed more in, inland for mating or, you know, escaping from predators, things like that. Okay. So these first amphibious creatures become reptiles. They select to become uh, reptiles over time. Okay. And these reptiles from these first reptiles about 300 million years ago emerged the first dinosaurs okay the first dinosaurs emerged about 250 million years ago and they dominated the earth right there is no competition for these guys they were big they were predators most of them a lot of them were herbivorous they were gigantic so nobody messed with them until about 65 million years ago what happened Oh yeah, that gigantic asteroid smashed into the Earth and forever destroyed the dinosaurs. The impact ejected lots of dust and debris up into the atmosphere and blocked the sun for years, for years. The dust took years to settle, okay? And this blocked out sunlight for the plants. The plants were now decaying and dying. Dinosaurs couldn't feed on the plants. The smaller ones couldn't feed on the dead dinosaurs. And now there is a, a food chain collapse. Okay. It wasn't the impact that destroyed the dinosaurs. It was the events that followed. The climatic changes. The earth got cold. And the dinosaurs went extinct. But... The mammals survived. 75% of animals died, but 25% survived. The ones who could adapt to the changing conditions, they survived. Our ancestors, shrew-like mammals who lived underground, were coming out for the first time and able to finally see sunlight and adapt. And they survived and they changed and became the first mammals that we share lineage with, the first apes, the first, the first monkeys, and then the first apes about 20 million years ago, the first humans about 3 million years ago with Homo habilis, okay? And there were many, many different species of humans before us, okay? Proconsul was one of the first apes about 18 million years ago, okay? Or Dipithecus ramidus about 4.4 million years ago. This was not a human, but not a, not necessarily an ape, uh, um, uh, original ape. It was a, 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 a intermediate species. And we have fossils for these. Okay, Australopithecus afarensis was one of the last non-human ancestors. Homo habilis about two million years ago, two point five million years ago. Okay, then Homo ergaster, Heidelbergensis, two hundred thousand, eight hundred thousand years ago. Okay, so this is human evolution. 300,000 years and by 20,000 years ago there it is and about 20,000 years ago the first civilizations the first farming okay our ancestors walked out of Africa they settled in different continents throughout the world 
Some found themselves in Europe, in Asia, North America, South America, the Arctic, okay, even Australia. We began to settle all continents as we are human explorers. But a lot of our ancestors began agriculture in Europe, near the Middle East. The first civilizations, Mesopotamians, some of the first civilizations. They lived around right here, okay? Right here. Near modern-day Palestine, near modern-day Israel. And this is the first, exactly, somebody mentioned it, the Fertile Crescent. Yes, this is where the conditions were right. It wasn't too cold. It wasn't too hot. The conditions were right enough to produce certain crops, which were staple crops for humans. When we, when we discovered agriculture for the first time, it's changed us forever. It forever changed us because now we can settle. We can hunker down. Instead of exploring, we can now hunker down and form cities and form trading and form economies. Wars, okay? Land, right? People fighting for land and resources. Language emerged. Uh, the first, not language, but the first literature emerged. Books, writing scientists okay about uh, uh, 600 years ago some of the first scientists that come up with world-changing ideas that were able to be passed down because of books and literature and, and symbols and uh, Copernicus discovers that the earth is not the center of the universe that there's another idea Newton discovers laws of gravity he now is able to predict the motions of the cosmos. And this changes our understanding of gravity and physics. He discovered many things. Sparking an industrial revolution. Which, which seeped out of Europe into the Americas. As people began to settle in America. In, in, in the United States. Trains. The steam engine began. right? The first steam engine the first guns, the, the first uh, medicine, the first automobiles, the first uh, trains and airplanes, st uh, steamboats and boats and ships. Now we can trade more. The first space travel 50 years, 60 years ago, 70 years ago. We go to space. We go to the moon, right? Look at the rapid changes in our species because of scientific changes, right? Because of these changes in our understanding of the world it sparked a revolution the industrial revolution which then gave rise to everything today the internet okay began to spread around the world communication systems and the hubble space telescope seeing peering into the cosmos the first iphone 2008 right social media begins people now begin to communicate with each other at lightning speeds right entire industries emerge open ai Okay. Artificial intelligence. Um, here we are, present day. A 14 billion year journey. That's amazing. That is utterly amazing. Who enjoyed that? <laughs> who liked who thought this was interesting? Um, and here is a great photo of how exactly we evolved, right? We have, uh, proto cells right here on top, self-replicating, uh, RNA molecules down to, uh, you know, different structures, organelles, which gave rise to more advanced features like nerves, photoreceptors, which gave rise to eyes. Right, then the first worm-like creatures, the first fish-like creatures with tails and then spines and then stru uh, m skeletal structures and limbs. Right, then we have the first uh, amphibious creatures, the first mammals, the first monkeys and apes and now humans. Right, this is incredible to understand that indeed simple organic molecules can generate such a complex entity such as a human if you give it enough time and enough changes to occur you can get something like this this is remarkable remarkable and remember guys there's an entire tree of life 
evolution is a tree constantly branching out, right? You can see here, bacteria branched out into archaea, then eukaryotes, and then plants, and then fungi. They stem off from fungi, and then uh, protosomes stem off from fungi, and, and uh, fish stem up from those guys, and amphibians stem from fish, and then reptiles stem from amphibians, and birds stem from reptiles, and mammals from, from other animals, um, uh, reptiles. It's a tree of life that we that describes evolution evolution's a fact and here's a, a picture here on the right which showing shows us our human ancestors there were many humans before us billions of people existed throughout history hundreds of billions of people right we have all, this is one of the last human ancestors that we share in common with chimpanzees Australopithecus afarensis. This is commonly called Lucy, right? The last universal common ancestor. And uh, after them, they uh, became they speciated into Habilis, and then Erectus, Heidelbergensis, Dorgicus, Sapien, then Neanderthals, right? Neanderthals had big brains, bigger heads than we do. Uh, and, and But we don't know why they died out we don't know why perhaps disease or perhaps war but we lived together for many years in fact many different human species lived together for many years and this picture always makes me it's creepy but this is how our human ancestors looked according to many many uh, artists, rend renditions, right? This is our ancestors. This is our family, our cousins. This is where we come from. And we have all these fossils, right? We have all these fossils. Each and every one of these humans and apes, we have fossils for. <laughs> just incredible our history to understand our history right um now i want to talk about the bigger picture the cosmic perspective here right um Here's a person on the earth, right? On earth, it's, we love it here. It's fun. It's, you can breathe, you can live, right? It's, it's a great place to be. But there's a bigger picture. Okay, if we zoom out, we see an entire city, an entire town, an entire city. Okay, this is just a kilometer away, 10 kilometers away. You start to see multiple cities okay then we start to see entire states entire countries a hundred a thousand kilometers out now we see entire continents a thousand ten thousand kilometers away from the earth the earth begins to become a blue marble that's that's our planet guys that's where we are this is our planet planet earth Let's zoom out. Let's see what else is out there. Oh, there's the moon, about 100,000 kilometers away. The moon orbits the Earth. It's just a big rock. <laughs> Let's zoom out more. A million kilometers. We start to see near-Earth asteroids. Asteroids surrounding us. Mars, about 100, 200, 300 million kilometers away is Mars. Mercury, the inner, the inner uh, planets, Mercury and Venus, and the Sun, about 100 million miles away. There's Jupiter, billion kilometers away. Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, the outer planets. And now we see the Kuiper Belt. Voyager 1, the entire solar system. There it is, about a trillion kilometers away, about one light year across, is our entire star system, our entire solar system. 
It's about a light year across. Amazingly big. But about 10 light years away, we see many other stars that come into view. Alpha Centauri, Procyon, Sirius, all the nearby stars come into view. Each one of those stars has perhaps planets orbiting them. Other planets, potentially living things, life. Probably not humans, but other types of life, perhaps. Okay, now 100 light years out, we start to see uh, star clusters and nebulas in the first spiral arms of our galaxy, right? Remember, we're, uh, we're on the outer outskirts of our galaxy. Look how gorgeous this is. The spiral arms of our Milky Way galaxy. Hundreds of billions of stars orbiting all around this galactic center. This Sagittarius A is a supermassive black hole at the center. That is what's holding the center together gravitationally. But on the outskirts of our solar of our gal galaxy is dark matter. The dark matter is also are all around us, holding the galaxy together gravitationally. And we are on the outskirts. We're just one little type of matter. <laughs> We're just one type of matter, one star in a sea of billions and billions of stars, all orbiting the galactic center. But let's zoom out even more. What else is there? Oh, we see satellite galaxies. We see other smaller galaxies around us. A million light years away, we start to see other galaxies in our neighborhood, our galactic neighborhood, right? Local galaxies, Andromeda, right? Ursa Major Group. These are other types of galaxies around us. Now, 100 million light years away, we start to see super clusters of galaxies. Now, each one of these dots is an entire galaxy full of hundreds of billions of stars, right? And each one of those dots is an entire galaxy. And there's entire clusters of galaxies. So, think of how many stars there are in each one of these pixels. And we keep zooming out billions of light years. You can go on for 100 billion light years of galaxies and stuff. The universe is about 90 billion light years across. That's all we can see. And look how <laughs> ordinary we are in this picture. We're just another dot. From this perspective, from this view... It's not clear that humans are significant. <laughs> Each one of those dots is a collection of trillions of stars. And this is mind-boggling to understand. But let's, back, let's zoom back in. And now we're going back to our star, our orbit, our planet, our neighborhood, our building, our park, and our body. But wait, there's another aspect to this world. There is another world in our eyes right we have a pupil a retina iris blood vessels look at what we're made of look at there's an entire world inside of us there's an entire world inside of us there's blood cells each of them moving through our bloodstream uh, through our bloodstreams little cells tr and your body is made of trillions of them trillions of cells each working together chemically inside of your bodies and each side of your cells is our chromosomes right which contain dna and these chromosomes make up who you are right each one of those molecules or atoms in your dna tell your body who you are right this is the inner mech machinery of your body right there that's how we operate an entire world entire universe inside of your body Let's go deeper, even still, in the atom, the oxygen atom. There's two electrons, and there's, there's multiple electrons in different shells orbiting a nuclei. 
a lot of the atom is empty. But inside your atoms are nuclei, protons and neutrons that are jiggling about. And these are made of quarks. Even still, the smallest object we know of, quarks and leptons. And that's as far as we can see in both ways. Right? These are the, the thresholds of our observations of reality. Right, from the small macro micro world to the mac to the uh, big world of planets and stars, it's incredible to know that that this is where we come from. Right, this is where we come from. That's mind-boggling to me. You know. And one last thing here before I go into like James Webb photos and stuff. By the way, any questions, anything you guys want me to talk about? There's the Earth. There's our planet. There's Neptune. There's Saturn. That's a real size, right, scale of our sun to other planets, right? People don't realize how big the sun is. The sun is gigantic. It's huge. Uh, compared to the earth. The earth, you can fit a million earths into the sun. Right? But there's even larger stars still. There's Sirius A. There's Pollux, a gi orange giant. Arcturus, a red giant. Some of these stars are ready to go supernova ready to explode and just before they explode they become inflated they get bigger hypergiants these are really gigantic stars full of lots of mass that are ready to really go supernovae some of these will turn into black holes some stars turn into black holes because there's just so much mass there's nowhere to go but warping space-time it's so much that it turns into a black hole it's incredible what's possible <laughs> look how big the earth is compared to the biggest star that we know of it's not even a grain of sand in an ocean right it's like look how gigantic these stars are compared to the earth that's incredible We are small, yes, but we can do big things. Right? There are things we can do and discover. I think every discovery is a new hope, a new understanding that changes everything. What is behind all of this? Well, <laughs> why, why does that even matter? I mean, why does there have to be somebody behind us? Why can't things just be? We just are. We just, we just are, you know, but these are galaxies. These are James Webb telescope photos that we can see. We can peer deeper into the cosmos and see actual nebulae. These are how stars are born. These are stellar nurseries. Can you guys see? Stellar nurseries. These are, this is a real photo, a real photo, guys, of stars being born in the universe. A real photo. These are real baby stars, right? These are baby stars. Some of these stars are maybe a few thousand years old. Just a few thousand years old. Look at them all being made. And this entire thing is light years across. Right? Some of these stars are very close together. Some are far away. But that's amazing. Right? And all these gas clouds, all this orange stuff are, is material. The stuff we're made of. Carbon and oxygen and hydrogen. These is, we are made of the cosmos. We are made of star stuff. 
that's what that means. We are made of star stuff, right? We are made of the stuff of stars. And that's incredible to understand. But here's a star that died. Some stars die and they turn into nebulae like this. The outer layers are peeling outwards into space. So. No, the some of these nebulae are close. They're closer than a few thousand light years. They are very close together. Very close to us. I mean, some of the stars are probably, yeah, maybe uh, hundreds of thousands of years old. But some stars can be even younger. Um, what happens when two stars collide? Depends on the, the size. Um, typically, they form a larger star or they turn into uh, they explode or something. Or turn into black holes. Here is a neutron star. These are galaxies in the infrared spectrum. There are different types of light that we can't see with our eyes, but the James Webb can see. Right? The James Webb telescope can see more than we can with our eyes. Um, so there's different layers of the world that we can't even see, but the James Webb can see. So this gives us more insight on what galaxies are made of. As you can see here. There's a lot more that meets the eye. Ooh. Now that's cool. Webb is equipped with five IR cameras, gamma, and x-ray. Wow. Yeah. Infrared light telescopes allow us to peer deeper into the universe. Um, there are longer wavelengths. They're able to see deeper into clouds and things like that. Nebulae, clouds. Um, and that's why we're able to get these amazing pictures. Because if this was visible light, we could not see. Right? We couldn't even see this far. Um, but the different types of light enables us to see deeper into the world. Just amazing photos. These are real things that exist out there, guys. These are real photos, real nebulae. Here's the moon of Saturn, Titan, from the James Webb. You can see the... It's incredible. It's an incredible moon that has lakes on it. Methane lakes. Liquid. There's liquid lakes on the moon of Titan. Liquid. But it's not water. It's methane. It's so cold there that even methane is a, is a liquid. Yeah, we can focus better than that. Yeah, yeah. I love these uh, nebulae. Show the surface picture we have. Okay. Titan surface images. Wow, we actually have images of Titan surface. It's right here. It actually has an atmosphere. A very thick atmosphere, actually. In fact... Titan has a thicker atmosphere than even us, than even Earth. It's just not oxygen. There's no oxygen for us to breathe there, but it's it's a very thick atmosphere. And um, it even has liquid on its surface, which is just incredible. And why scientists think it's one of the best candidates for life. Um, how, about, how about Mars? Mars surface... 4K. This always boggles my mind. Yeah. 
You can glide suit for three miles off a normal mountain. Wow. That's amazing. Thicker atmosphere equals more pressure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. How do they take pictures of Titan? Um, I believe it was one of the Cassini probes. One of the, either Cassini or another probe that went there and sent down a vehicle. Somebody can correct me. Uh, but these are also, these are real photos from Mars, from Perseverance or, you know, the other rovers like Curiosity or these are real photos of Mars, guys. This is another planet. <laughs> You're looking at photos on a screen on your phone of another planet. Think about what's happening right now, right? And think of what science is capable of getting us. Mars is... A world of wonders, as Sagan says. But on Mars, we think that it used to be full of water on the surface. And you can there's actual evidence, geological evidence, that some of the craters of Mars, like this one, Gale Crater, actually has evidence of running rivers that used to run, once exist on Mars. Rivers and oceans and lakes and lots of water that once existed on the surface and you can see erosion not just by wind but also water and there are specific materials and rocks that can only exist under water conditions and we see them on mars we really see them Okay. Can water come back? Well, not now. It's well, if we did introduce water to the surface, it would not be able to even stay there on the current surface because it's too cold. There's too, there's not enough pressure to keep it there. It would just evaporate. It would sublime and turn into snow. But if we made the Martian surface uh, warmer. And we introduced an episode. Oh, look, there's Ingenuity. There's the helicopter. If you guys have seen it on the news lately, this was the helicopter that we actually sent onto Mars. And it was able to take some pictures up. It was able to travel but a bit up in the, in the uh, sky and take some pictures. Yeah, these are real pictures. These are actual pictures from the surface of Mars. This is in 4K, right? Incredible. Incredible. Uh, yeah, so on Mars, you can actually see, you know, very far into the surface because there's a little atmosphere in the way, but there's also lots of sunlight. So Mars isn't too far from the sun. You still have a nice sunset. You still have a nice, nice lighting and, and energy, solar energy, enough to make energy for solar panels. Amazing, amazing craters. These are craters... Wow, you could see the tracks in the sand, the regolith. In fact, the Martian regolith is very similar to Earth regolith, Earth material. Uh, the elements are very similar. You could potentially go on Mars and introduce a couple things to it and produce plants from its regolith. But look at that. Look at these, these uh, lines in the rock right you can see these this erosion occurring and a lot of this is from the wind but a lot of this is from water right a lot of that erosion is is water erosion which is evidence that there was once lots of water on the surface okay um another crater here's an interesting one wow That's incredible. Does it have an atmosphere around like uh, around it like Earth? Yes, Mars has a very, very thin atmosphere, about 1% of that of Earth's. So you couldn't breathe on Mars for very long. You might be able to breathe for like two seconds before you suffocate it. <laughs> but uh, it is not at all enough to protect anything. 
Most of that is title EBV. The rock that made that crater is only quarter the size that killed the dinosaurs. Wow. Okay. What else do you guys want to see? Anything? Any requests? Let's check out Neptune. <laughs> um, let me see what's taking so long here. Well, Neptune is something we have. We don't have much evidence or much uh, data on the surface. There is no surface that we could actually take pictures of. We haven't been there yet. But we passed by it. Uh, I think there's Voyager photos of it. Let's see. Neptune is very far away from us, okay, guys? It is extremely far away from us. And uh, it's hard to get to. But we did make an approach in 1979 with Voyager. Fun fact, it's actually not blue. Neptune is not actually blue. It's actually grayish color. But it's only because you know, it makes it more interesting to make it blue. We did that. It's not actually blue like that. Although it would be amazing to, for it to be that color. Um, but yeah. These are some of the closest images of Neptune we ever have gotten. It's not a water planet. No, it's it's gas. It's not water. But there are some water planets out there that... Planet K2 has atmospheric science of possible life. Really? Interesting. Yeah, Neptune has... See this... See this eye here looking thing? Sorry. You see this eye looking thing here? There it is. You guys see that? That eye? That's a storm. That's like a hurricane kind of storm. Right? There's... On that right now, there's tons of winds going on. Uh, that storm's probably there, still. Some storms on these planets last for hundreds of years. Because there's no friction, there's no land. There's no stopping these storms from, from, from slowing down much. So they stay for, they last for many years. Um, Jupiter's red dot, yeah. Here's a very close-up photo of Jupiter's storm. And these winds are really, really fast. And remember, yeah, like, like uh, Cancel was saying, up to 10 Earths can probably fit in this one storm. <laughs> 10 whole planet Earths can fit in this one storm on Jupiter. Okay. Can we look at Saturn? Yeah. This is a, from the Hubble telescope. But that's amazing. That's gorgeous. The rings, they look like, um, you know, they're solid. They're not really solid, uh, you know. They're made of lots of small rings of dust particles and rocks, grains of sand, things like that. That orbit the planet, a lot, as, long, as well as moons, like Enceladus and Titan and, and Ganymede and all kinds of, uh, moon. well not Ganymede, Ganymede is from uh, Jupiter. The rings around it are made of small ice particles and um, Saturn rings. They don't last very long actually, the Saturn's rings are very, actually very very uh recently made about a couple hundred million years ago they weren't they won't always be like that in fact soon relatively soon they'll, they'll actually be gone forever is jupiter hot <sighs> um well 
yes, in the center, it is very hot, but uh, in the atmosphere, the temperatures can vary very greatly, depending on where you are. But yeah, here's, here are Saturn's rings. They look more like this if you were to go close up, right? They look more like this. Of course, we don't have a perfect picture, but they would look more like this where you have lots of small dust grains and ice grains like that, right? K2 has potential biology, uh, produced methane and CO2 in its atmosphere, but that's it's about 100 light years away. Wow, okay. Yeah, so we when we look for planets, we look for, we don't look at little green men on the planets. We don't look for little green people, right? <laughs> we don't look for that with telescopes. When we want to find life, we look at the atmosphere. What What is the atmosphere uh, look like? Signs of life on Earth takes form of oxygen, right? Oxygen is, con there's a continuous supply of oxygen. Carbon dioxide is another source of life, another evidence of life on Earth. We can see carbon dioxide fluctuate every day. That's evidence of a continuous supply of these things. Um, so recently, James Webb has looked and peered into the atmospheres of a planet called K218b, which is a massive planet that is roughly eight times as massive as the Earth. It's eight times as big. And it is... It is uh, something called a, a, Haitian, a Haitian planet. This is a water world. This is a massive uh, rocky planet, but a very thick water layer on its surface. Okay, we're talking like thousands of miles, like hundreds of miles deep of oceans, right? On the Earth, it's maybe like 10 miles, but here we're talking hundreds of miles of water or more, probably more. And uh, it's mostly ocean on its surface. So there is no land. Yeah, also also lots of water vapor in this atmosphere. It's tons of water. So when we peered into its atmosphere, we saw methane. Okay, we saw oxygen. Uh, I'm sorry. We saw methane and carbon dioxide. Here's, here it is. We saw methane. Here's a spectrum of the atmosphere. Yeah, the universe is amazing. This is incredible, right? So lots of methane. Like, look at how much methane there is. Um, there's also carbon dioxide in huge amounts. Huge amounts of CO2. There's also dimethyl sulfide. And uh, pretty much that's the main majority of what the atmosphere is like. But imagine, just imagine if that carbon dioxide was generated by aliens in the oceans of k2 imagine if life is on that planet right now we don't really know for sure but it could be it could be you know these initial web observations also provided a possible detection of a molecule called dimethyl sulfide on earth this is only produced by life now that's awesome the bulk of the DMS in Earth's atmosphere is emitted from phytoplankton in marine environments. Guys, I'm getting chills. I just got chills, guys. <laughs> um, just kidding. But um, on Earth, this this gas is produced by life, and we found it on this planet. Okay. I mean, this is a, a big indicator that there's life there, okay? If I were to guess, I would say, yes, this planet has life. I would give it a 40% chance. Um, but that's just me talking. I'm not a scientist, but I'm just supposing that, hey, lots of water. We have the right ingredients. It's, it looks like it's orbiting a dwarf star in the habitable zone, so it's... You know, it seems to be have all it seems to have all the requirements required for life. So 
you're giving it high 60s wow that's very 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 uh bold yeah i mean it's uh, hey this is one of the best candidates probably we've found so far for life outside of the solar system now in terms of our own solar system and something that we could potentially figure out within our own lifetimes is Enceladus. This is a moon of Saturn. And this is perhaps one of my favorite planetary bodies in the solar system. Enceladus. This is an actual photo of Enceladus from NASA's Cassini. It, went, it flew by really, really close to it. And it took this amazing photo of Enceladus. And... Look at the cracks on its surface. You can see these little wavy lines and curvy lines and stretch marks kind of, right? You can, you can see the stretch marks of it. The entire surface is full of ice and snow. That white surface is ice and snow, literal snow. And it's been compacted and underneath the icy crust of... Enceladus is an ocean, a huge ocean deep down. You guys can see this picture here. Deep in Enceladus, this is a bad picture. Uh, right here's a better one, actually. Here's a better one. This is my favorite photo. Okay. Uh, deep under the ice of Enceladus is a, come on, really? Okay, there it is. I mean, that's good enough for you guys, right? Deep under the oceans, deep under the icy crust, the icy crust is an ocean of liquid water, liquid ocean water, and it's salty. It's just like Earth's ocean. Literally, it's the same freaking water. The same freaking water, guys. It has hydrothermal vents, just like the Earth. Okay? And it, it spews out water. And we can see it. We can capture. In fact, Cassini took a probe, sped, uh, threw a probe near it. It captured some of that gas. And it discovered water. CO2. Okay? And it discovered amino acids. The building blocks of life are in Enceladus. In the oceans, near hydrothermal vents, with heat and energy, tidal friction. Guys, this is this is just absolutely amazing, and it's been there for a long enough time to, to perhaps develop life on its in its oceans. Okay, just wonder what. Just imagine what types of life there could be. Now, there's almost no sunlight. These are very dark oceans, very salty oceans. But just imagine what type of life there could be there. I mean, here on Earth, we have bioluminescence, bioluminescent life, right? We have, we have life forms that actually produce their own light, which help them navigate. So perhaps in the oceans of Enceladus is, is an infestation of fish like monster species that uh, are bioluminescent they're light they're glowing up and they're eating each other and they're that that's possible right these are possibilities and imagine discovering that in our lifetime it's possible just imagine what's possible there guys the universe is full of wonder full of wonders and, and amazing things to explore right so Um, hope you guys are, are enjoying this. Anything else you guys want to see? Oh yeah, the oceans of Enceladus are, well, I don't think there's more water than, than the Earth. I think that's Titan. Water amount. The, the oceans are deeper, but this, it's not that there's more water than the Earth. It's, it's that the oceans are deeper, right? I think they're maybe three, four times deeper than the, than the, um, than the Earth's oceans. So they're vastly deeper. So you can imagine, you know, really crazy things existing there. 
Um, interesting to think how intelligent they could be given dolphins and whales intelligence. Oh yeah, I mean, sure. But the funny thing about whales is that whales are not fish. Whales don't actually breathe underwater. They don't actually absorb oxygen from the water. Whales are actually mammals. And why is that? Oh yeah. This is a whale. This is a whale ancestor, guys. You're looking at a whale ancestor. Okay. Pachycetus. One of the most astonishing revelations of evolution. Whale evolution. And we can see these fossils. We, we, when we dig up these fossils in the, in the geological strata, it's the reason why it's called Pachycetus is because they discovered it near Pakistan, near modern-day Pakistan. And this is where we think there were low-lying waters where these mammals that resembled like dogs, they, they moved into the waters for perhaps predatorial reasons, food resources, right? They moved into the waters and what happened was they, developed, they evolved for webbed feet, longer tails, web tails, fins, right? So you can see here over time, they became more aqu uh, aquatic. Their snouts became longer. They eventually became blowholes for the modern day whales. So there is, a, there is this interesting evolution that occurred to, to whales. And over, this took about 60 million years, right? This is about 60 million years of evolution. But it's just remarkable that that these that whales are mammals and now we know why it was a mystery for so long why are whales mammals well now we know they come from the land so that's remarkable to me here was what it looked like when it was in the middle of its evolution right the intermediate uh, stages it was an aquatic species an aquatic mammal Why are turtles in the tree? Where? What do you mean? <laughs> Where are turtles in the tree? Oh, turtles are reptiles. Turtles, um... Turtle evolution. Turtles are really old. Really, really old. Uh, we're talking 300 million years old. What about platypus? <laughs> um, yeah, so this is the, yeah, this is where the origin of turtles here, pretty much they come from reptiles with longer tails. They developed that shell-like exoskeleton, and that's really what they are. Amazing as well. Amazing as well. All life on the earth is connected. We're all connected. We all are ancestor we all are um, cousins in some way even to trees show us extinct animals okay extinct animals there is a ground sloth this guy was big and huge woolly mammoths Tasmanian tigers, dinosaurs, saber-toothed cat, dodo birds. <laughs> These are some of the commonly known extinct animals, but there is a lot of other extinct mammals that people are not aware of. Some of them are incredibly crazy. Here's one. Dadon. These guys lived in America 20 million years ago. Mam there was a time in the Earth's history where mammals dominated and were just huge, okay? And these guys were nasty. Um, here are animals called glyptodons. And they were enormous armored mammals, okay, that existed even 10, up to 10,000 years ago. 
They were roughly the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. <laughs> okay, these guys were huge. Okay. Um, they were able to... Uh, they weren't able to pull their head out into their shell like turtles, but they relied on their really thick armor uh, for defense. Um, they used their tails as clubs they, they, to hit predators and, you know. Here's another bird. One of the largest birds to ever exist. 24 feet wingspan. <laughs> Thing was massive. Argentavis. Um, here's another one. Paraceratherium. This guy was crazy. Okay, this guy stood 20 feet tall. He was a mammal. Not a dinosaur, a mammal. Okay, this guy is crazy. He lived about 25 million years ago in Asia, near China, India, that area, and he was huge. I mean, look at look at how he compares to even some dinosaurs. Uh, and rhinos. He was gigantic. Megalodon, or some of these guys, huge sharks. Giant otters, giant beavers. I mean, there are so many mo so many animals that existed before us. Show Titanosaur. Yeah, one of the largest dinosaurs we know of, called Hitanosaur. Uh Here's a good comparison between an elephant and a and a uh, Hitanosaur. I mean, this guy was 122 feet long. <laughs> oh my gosh! 100. Imagine being a 120 foot long animal. <laughs> like that's crazy. That is crazy. Okay, that is crazy. These guys were nasty. And by the way, they were vegan. <laughs> they didn't eat. They were vegetarian. They only ate plants. So where did they get their protein? Oh, yeah. Plants. <laughs> they were not protein deficient. <laughs> Mind you, there is about 30% more O2 in the atmosphere to assist in sizes. Yeah. 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 For sure. Oxygen was um, more prevalent back then. Also... There was more fauna. There was more um, tree, bigger trees, thicker leaves. There were there was a lot more CO two as well, driving that as well. A lot more food to go around. Uh, yeah, these animals could not survive. Yes, yeah. Today, these guy, these dinosaurs can never survive in today's climates. They they just couldn't. Um. But that's why we're here, because we survived. Everything is bigger. Yeah, everything is bigger. I mean, from insects to fish to... I mean, it goes on and on. But uh, that's just incredible that we can uncover these things, guys. And that, that, at, the end of the, at the end of the day, what makes me so fascinated about all this is that we are some of the first people ever in human history to uncover these amazing facts about the world. Just even 50, 60, even 100 years ago, nobody understood this stuff, right? Imagine telling this to somebody 100 years ago about all these things we've now discovered about the universe. They would be mind blown, but yet we have it here in front of us, able to understand every day of the week. At any moment we want to, we can uncover all the knowledge we know of. That is what astounds me the most about science, that it's for everybody it's a global endeavor it doesn't it doesn't say oh you're you you're not part of my cult right uh, oh you have to pray to get to my belief no science is for everyone okay it doesn't discriminate it doesn't care who you are it doesn't care what you believe in science is for everybody to know to, to learn and love and do and that's what i love most about science let alone all these amazing facts about the world that you can never get from the Bible. <laughs> you know? And, uh...
I just, yeah, it's amazing to me. Oh, okay, anything else? Do you know anything about eternal inflation theory? Yes. Um, so... Alan Guth comes up with this model about 50 years ago, 1980, about 30, 25 year, 35 years ago. And he was trying to incorporate quantum mechanics into the Big Bang model, see where it fit, because relativity breaks down at the Big Bang. and But eternal inflation comes in, right? Alan Guth comes up with this model where he... Um, Alan Guth is not the only one, right? But... He he was really the the main one who introduced it in 1979. Here, the there is a couple problems. Okay, the universe seems to be incredibly flat and uniform all over. Right, if you, it doesn't matter where you are in the universe, it seems to be uniform, and we nobody really understood what that meant. How could it be that the universe is so flat and so so uniform all across? And how does that fit into the Big Bang model? Because we knew that the universe was smaller in the past, but we couldn't figure out why it would be so uniform today. Well, Alan Goose's model describes perfectly why it's homogeneous or isotropic. It's because the universe was smaller, but it didn't just expand. It magnified. The universe was smaller in its original state, but it then magnified really rapidly, okay, super rapidly. It, it was too fast for anything to change about the uniformity. The uniformity was, re was retained even with the expansion. That's what inflation, the crux of inflation means. So it also explains why the universe is flat because as the universe was curled in the in its origins, it then it, it rapidly magnified in that curve curvature flattened out. And now we have a flat universe. Okay. So that's the general idea of inflation. Then from there you can determine well, where do those come from? Where did inflation come from? Well, now we understand it's a quantum fluctuation, okay? Um there is a specific false vacuum state that certain quantum fields go into and they can yield certain infl inflaton particles that then decay and become baryonic matter, which then inflates and from there turns into the modern universe you know today. So the, the, all, the, the entire point of inflationary cosmology is to explain why we see the universe we do today, right? To the best of our ability. Now, this inflation is a very, very efficient process. And what's that mean? Well, the energy never is left a gone. Energy is always conserved in inflation. And if this is the case, it means that inflation could go on forever. It doesn't stop. And if that's the case, inflation never stops into the future. Well, Perhaps if there's other quantum fields nearby, our universe, well, those can also inflate rapidly and become other Big Bangs, right? Now, now you can imagine a quantum field or space-time where there's tons and tons of Big Bangs happening all around us, tons and tons of inflationary events happening all around us constantly, and it's possible. Now, the question is, well, where, where's the evidence? Would there be evidence of this inflation? Well, w would there be evidence of these other universes, right? Where's the multiverse, right? This opened up doors for the multiverse. Okay, where would, the, where would this evidence be? Well, the first evidence would be in the cosmic microwave background radiation. This is what we have pictures of about the early universe. This is the earliest baby pictures of the universe. So... If we found them anywhere, we'd find them here. Now, we would look 
for if there's an inf there, if there's a plane of universes expanding outwards into into each other like bubbles, right? Imagine bubbles. Imagine tiny points expanding into bubbles, right? That's what inflation means on a visual way, right? So you can imagine these blobs becoming inflated all around you. Now, you can imagine that these bubbles would eventually collide with each other. Okay? So so if there would be evidence of these other universes, we'd find them in the CMB where you have these you find these bubbles, but do we see them? No. Not really. We don't really see good evidence yet that there are other bubbles or but any evidence of collisions of other universes. So, yes, exactly, Ken. So that's what I was, I was, I'm about to allude to. Yes. We might, however, it might be still true that there are other universes around us. It's just that they're inflating so rapidly that they're just beyond our uh, ability to, to observe them because they're inflating so rapidly and so are we away from them that we could never see the collision. There would never be a collision between them. Also, they could be in existing in higher dimensions that we don't have access to. Um, so, it's very, very profound. Um, but again, another another mind-boggling model of, of the universe that continuously changes everything about how you see the world. Um, but to think that the entire universe could have started from empty space itself. Something, an entire universe from empty space, what you would call empty space, right? Nothingness, what you would call nothing. The universe, an entire universe can emerge from that. That is amazing. They could be right here and just harmonizing where we don't feel them. Yeah, yeah. Perhaps we are inter perhaps we are interfe being interfered by other universes, but we just don't have the ability. They're on a different wavelength, a different frequency that we couldn't even see them. Very, very mysterious. The answer maybe will never be understood, but that's what we try to do in science. We try as hard as we can to get to the answers without bias, without expecting uh, the answer to be what we want it to be. <laughs> all right, a couple more questions. I'm getting tired here, but thank you all for coming in. Um, 130 people appreciate that that's a lot for uh, a life but by the way this is my desktop i'm not even on my phone so that's why we're having less viewers today uh is it possible for aliens to survive with something other than oxygen yes ab absolutely yes yes there could be there could be there could be an entire silicon-based life forms that don't even require oxygen to breathe um there could be, I mean, even on the earth, we, there are many microbes that don't need oxygen, right? That we, oxygen is not required for life, but it is one of the byproducts of many life forms we know today. It's a sign of higher life forms and more advanced life forms. Um, so if we were to find oxygen in, on a planet with a different, with fluctuating levels daily or you know, weekly. That would be fantastic evidence of life. And I'm talking free oxygen, right? Not 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 oxygen binded by iron or other elements or you know, water. Free oxygen is something that is a great sign of life. Okay. Uh I want to take a look at the lunar Apollo uh, 11 videos. Wait, Apollo mission videos. Whose mind is being blown right now? <laughs> who's who's enjoying this live? Here's actual footage of people on the moon. 
uh, with their rovers. Feather and hammer. Okay, yeah. So this is an amazing uh, Apollo missions. The uh, the uh, the rovers. And you can see the dust. See the dust that goes around the wheels. You see that? See how it floats in the air for a little bit of time before it comes. In? That's you can't fabricate this. Okay, there's no way you could fabricate this with photograph with Photoshop in 1969. Okay, no, we're 1970. Um, that is clear evidence that they were actually on the moon. You can't. You you cannot fo fi uh, fake that. Okay. Also, look at how hard it is for him to turn, and look at how look at how much air he's getting, even at simple speeds. Okay, this cannot is not something that you can just make up. Okay, this is something that uh, only happens on a, on the lunar surface because there's no friction, there's very little friction there, and there's low gravity. Okay, but here's another. Uh, an amazing video of uh, an astronaut, David Scott, doing the feather and hammer experiment. He has a feather in one hand right here and a hammer in this hand. And he drops them onto the ground on the moon. And uh, on uh, in a vacuum, we would expect, on the earth, we would expect the feather to drop slowly and the hammer to fall to the ground, right? Because air. But on the moon, there is no air. Okay, it's almost a vacuum. So, watch what happens when he drops the two items. If you guys can see. Look at that. They fell at the same time. <laughs> Did you guys see that? They fell at the same... A feather and a hammer dropped on this... You can't fake that. <laughs> you can't fake that on the moon, guys. It's not possible. Uh, you can't fake that on the Earth. That's not possible. On a movie set. Okay. So... Okay. Anyway. That's incredible. That This is a grand demonstration that, that gravity is a real thing and that uh, there is really... We really went to the moon. Okay. We also have NASA moon rocks. There's a NASA vault that NASA has. You can actually go there and look at the rocks from the moon they collected. And it's a huge vault, right? It's gigantic. But look what's inside. Moon rocks. Look at that. You can look at these moon rocks and you see tiny micro uh, impacts, okay? Micro impacts that only could exist on the moon because on Earth, there's air. The air destroys any asteroids that come to any smaller asteroids or any grains will just evaporate, right? Um, but on the moon, there is no air, so it, it, they will not evaporate. Those little micro grains hit those rocks and turn into micro impacts. And we can see this, see these on the moon, uh, moon rocks. And uh, you cannot replicate this. You can't fake this. These are, this is a real phenomenon that happens only on the moon. Okay. Uh, you, I, I've seen that in the movie Gravity. Yeah, Interstellar. Uh, it's a cool movie too. I love that one too. Um, but yeah, here it is. Here's a moon, here's a moon rock. Here's a rock from the moon itself. Right, you can see it's porous. You can see there's lots of little impacts. It comes from those meteorites. That strike the surface and you can study them you can study these rocks 
You're right now looking at rocks from the moon. That's amazing. Okay. What is the fundamental medium which quantum particles affect each other, like when we teleport? Mm, that's that's something we don't know. It could be space, but, but there are there are quantum interpretations that allow for an emergent space time, right? There's something even deeper than space time. There's something you can you can divide space and time itself into quantum particles or quantum states. You were there for the Apollo 17. Wow, awesome. There is no medium. Yeah, that that still, we don't know. There could be no medium. There could be some other weird thing going on. We don't really know. Also, I want to show you guys the uh, ISS Earth view. I, I, this always makes me... Whoa, a view, of, a view of the Earth from space. This is so cool. Absolutely mind-boggling. <laughs> That's amazingly gorgeous. Look at Earth just sitting there, chilling out. Oh, where's the curve? Where's the curve, guys? Do you guys see the curve? It looks flat to me. Wow. People don't even realize that you couldn't have gravity on a flat Earth. It wouldn't be possible. You couldn't have gravity the way we have it, okay? You would not be able to live on the surface like we are now because gravity wants to pull you towards the center of the mass. And if the earth is flat like a pancake, the center of mass would consistently be angled. If you were to travel on the outskirts of the flat plane, you would have to, you would be slanted. You'd be, your gravity would be angled so much that you would not be able to stand flat on the surface. And this is the funniest thing about flat earthers. They don't understand this simple gravi gravitational fact. You couldn't exist on the surface like we do today, especially not the edges. You would literally have to be slanted. You'd have to build your houses on a, <laughs> on a huge slant. So anyway, it's amazing that we have this footage Or how about astronauts in the space station playing with like, you know, water and stuff, you know? Here's an awesome video. What explains why my phone falls towards Earth rather than away when I let go? <laughs> Gravity. Okay. Um... Um, in sp so this is the ISS, right? And there is a specific phenomenon that happens with water when you're, when there's gravity. On Earth, water loves to collect. Like if I have a rag, water loves to collect on the rag. It doesn't, uh, but in space, because the gravity isn't present in the way it is on Earth, the... If you were to put water on a rag, watch what happens. How do you fake that, by the way? <laughs> How do you fake that? Okay, just, 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 just saying. Okay, so he has water in a little tube. Okay. It forms a spherical bubble, if you guys notice. Now he's putting it on the rag or the paper towel and look what happens. <laughs> he's wringing it out 
And look at this. It doesn't go down. It doesn't go anywhere. It stays on the rag. It doesn't want to leave. Because the water t the the water molecules are so much more bonded. The gra there is no gravity there to, to pull them towards the earth, right? So in space, the water wants to stay in the rag. There's no gravity to pull it down. Because on earth, the gravitational forces overcome that water tension force. But on in space, there is no such thing. That's why you can't wring out a rag in space. And that's crazy. I mean, you could if you, you know, like on his hand, he has water on his hand. You can see it there, right? But you can't do what you do on Earth because of lack of gravity. And that's remarkable. You can see the water loves to stick on things because gravity isn't present. All right. Um, here's how they sleep. Wait, I want to see them. Oh, wait a minute. There's a there's something awesome as well. A um, low gravity plane. These guys simulate gravity in different planets. It's so cool. Um, there's a plane you could go on and they actually simulate gravity. Um, th so the way you go on a plane, if you were to just free fall on a plane for a specific amount of time, you know, like when you're jumping on a trampoline, you know, when you jump on a trampoline and, um, you're holding a phone in your hand and when you're jumping with the phone, it feels like the phone's floating. That's literally what happens in space, right? Um, so when you're on a plane, when you free fall, the people in the cabin, they're free falling as well. And adjusting the velocity of the, of the plane, adjusting the, the direction, can you can simulate certain amounts of gravity. And from zero Gs to higher. So here, they're simulating, I think this is Martian gravity? No, this is uh, probably half gravity of Earth. <laughs> That's, I think this is Martian gravity, actually. Maybe this is Martian gravity. On Mars, gravity is about, oh, this is lunar gravity. Okay, so this is if you're on the moon. If you notice, it looks very similar to the people that... The astronauts footage you can jump pretty high here's some astronauts working out <laughs> that's pretty cool I mean it's not perfect right but <laughs> I could never do that. I would probably just get dizzy. I can never do that. That's pretty cool, though. Okay. Um, yeah. I just want to show you guys that. It's pretty cool. Um, yeah. Space is dangerous. Like, oh, my God. Ooh. This guy has a new video out. Journey through space time. Brand new video. Let's see what it's about. 4K. Cool. Ooh, galaxies. Ooh, space time. Whoa, that's cool. That's cool. So he's, he's showing the space time, I guess the geodesics that the warping of the geodesics that's really cool <laughs> 
13 billion years ago. The universe looked like kind of like that. Lots of gas and dust, but also lots of dark matter, mostly dark matter. Oh, you can see how it was curved. They were more curved, and then you can see how it flattens out. That's really cool. It's still mostly dark matter. Yeah, but I mean, obviously, um, we care more about the regular matter. But yeah, you're right. It's still mostly dark matter. Um, here's interesting. Here's how gravity really works. You know, here's how you really are supposed to look at it. It warps all the space and time around it, not just like the two dimensional surface. Yeah, gravity's warping all direct in all directions, right? All of time and space is being warped around Earth, not just the surface, right? That's why everything around it is being curved towards it. Just like the moon. Satellites. Satellites are constantly falling towards the Earth, right? It's con it's constantly in a curve, it's warp it's trapped in the curvature of the Earth's gravity, but it's pushing forward enough to keep it so that it's constantly orbiting around the earth forever uh well not forever but technically it's slowly losing its uh st stability <clears throat> just amazing how gravity really works like You're so amazed? Yeah, it's, it is amazing. What are they saying here? I'm guessing... Oh yeah, the tidal. So here's the tidal forces, right? The moon pulls on specific areas of the earth at given times, giving rise to the tides. That's why we have tides, right? The moon is pulling and tugging on parts of the water. The oceans are being tugged away by the moon. And... As the Earth rotates, the moon is pulling specific areas. So here's how an apple really falls to the Earth. Again, it's extremely hard to even fathom gravity because we can't think on a 4D level, right? Like this is a four-dimensional, this is a four-dimensional phenomenon. We can't imagine it. But this is a more accurate depiction on a three-dimensional way. Um, it's really the it's really the earth pushing on hum us in a way um, it, it just absolutely amazing just absolutely amazing okay uh, here's sun stars black holes accretion disks that's really cool stuff right there. It's just free fall in a warp space time. Yeah, in fact, everything is in the universe moving at through space time at the same speed. Speed of light. Everything in the universe is actually moving through space and time at the speed of light. It's just that some of your motion is in the temporal dimension. Some of your dimension, some of your uh, motion, is in the temporal dimension, or the spatial dimension. It depends. Light has all of its motion in the spatial dimension, all in the spatial dimensions. That's why it experiences no time. There's not enough time for it to go faster than the speed of light. That's why it's traveling the speed of light. That's why it's a constant. Nothing's faster. We are moving through space-time, but all, almost all of our motion is in our temporal dimension. So we're, we're, we're moving through time way more, very little through space, right? So if you can imagine everything in the universe traveling through space-time in a straight line, 
that's really what we're doing. It's just that gravity is when some some of us intersect with each other, some of our geodesics intersect with each other, giving the illusion that there's some kind of acceleration of gravity. And it's hard, like, if you guys don't know my video on this, I have a video on, on relativity. You should watch it. Um, I explain all about it in a very simple way. Um, I explain relativity here, and then I explain time, okay? So, this is a wrong depiction, right? This is what you see typically, right? What you see typically is the earth rotating around the sun, and you have an indent in the fabric. That's not true, right? That's not necessarily true. Very interestingly, okay, imagine two ants on the surface of the earth moving in a parallel line towards the North Pole, right? They're moving in a straight line. These two ants are moving in a straight line. On the earth, though, because the earth is curved, even though the ants are moving in a straight line directly north, they intersect with each other. Does that make sense to you guys? Does that, does that make sense to you guys? Because of the Earth's curvature, the geodesics of the Earth's curvature, the ants are going to intersect with each other and be, at some point at the North Pole. So that is something to keep in mind, right? Um, This is what's happening, like I said before, everything in the universe is moving through space-time in a straight line. It's just that curvature of space and time itself, right? The curvature of the fabric of the cosmos directs us to curve our geodesics and we intersect with each other, right? Just so when an apple falls to the earth, it's not that uh, the earth is pulling on it, it's that the apple's geodesic a world line is intercepting the world line of the Earth's. And uh, that's what gravity is. Okay? It's hard to, it's hard to fathom at first. But that's what gravity is. It gives the illusion that we are, there's a gravitational force here. You can see those two people you can see how they're moving through space-time, the curved space-time. It looks like they're moving together. It looks like there's an acceleration happening, but it's not. It's that they're just intersecting each other, the geodesics are. So, that's what gravity really is. Now, time is relative too. Space and time are relative, okay? So, from the Earth, this is mind-boggling, okay? But from the Earth, from the Earth's perspective, you, if you see a rocket driving, uh, flying by, it looks like the rocket's moving, right? Relative to the Earth, it looks like the rocket's moving. But if the rocket was stationary and the Earth was moving, well, it would still be the same. You would still think that the rocket's moving, even though the Earth is, right? So this shows you that motion's relative. Okay. Um, okay, so both are equally valid. Both instances of this are equally valid. Because all motion is relative. Now, imagine throwing a ball on a rocket, right? Imagine you're in an airplane or a rocket throwing a ball. That ball is moving at 30 miles an hour, according to you, from your standpoint, because you are, relatively speaking, sta stationary. But if, it was on, if, but if it was on the Earth, watching the rocket fly by with you in it throwing the apple, well, then now I have to add the speed of the rocket to the speed of the apple, right? So now it's moving at 20,030 miles an hour. We have to add the two speeds, okay? So from my perspective on the Earth, the apple is moving at 20,030 miles an hour. But from the space station, it's only moving at 30. However... 
Does it, you guys understand that? Okay. I know it's a lot to take in. <laughs> but some but Einstein discovered something really creepy about light. And this is a special theory of relativity. He discovered really something really crazy that this does not apply to light. If I were to shine a flashlight in the rocket, okay, I would see that the light is moving the speed of light in the rocket. But I would also see the same thing from the Earth's perspective. Even if I was on the Earth, I would still see the light moving at the speed of light. So I don't add them together anymore. The speed of light is invariant. It's the same for everybody. No matter your, your, no matter your reference frame, the speed of light is constant. You don't add it together. It's always the same. So because of this fact, Right? Because of this really fascinating fact about reality. If light moves through a curved space-time, no matter how much curvature there is, light will still travel from A to B at the same time as even no curvature. Okay? So, imagine these two lines here. Right? Imagine these two lines. Through this curve, so look at this curved Earth, right? Look how Earth curves the space time around it. But now we're imagining two lines here one called A and B, the other called D and C up top. Do you guys see that? See how D and C is curved, but B and A is not curved? Okay. Now recognize that D and C, the, this line here, has more distance. Right? There's more distance here. It's a curved line. It's more distance. Does that make sense? Okay. But the crazy thing is that even though there's more distance for D and C, light passing through both lines still arrive at their destinations at the same time. Even though there's more distance. So light can travel more distance in the same time as something without curvature even though there's more curvature to this line. That, we, that changes everything, okay? Because what, how the math work, great question. How does this make sense? Here's why. Even though both light beams travel at the same speed and they end up at the same spot at the same time, In order for speed to remain constant, something has to change. What speed? Distance over time, right? So what out of these three values has to change for the speed and distance to be the same? Time. Time has to change. Time has to be slower. Time has to be slower for the light. Time must be longer to keep up with the distance. This is called time dilation. Exactly. Yes. This is a great. This is like. This is the craziest thing you can ever probably imagine. Okay. And here's a great fantastic experiment called a light clock. Here's a great depiction of this, right? This is a great depiction of time dilation. Imagine two light clocks where these balls are moving up and down, right, at this, uh, whatever, the same rate. But one of these clocks is stationary. The other clock is moving, right? There's motion. But the light is traveling the same, like we said before, it's traveling the same speed, right? So because the light is beams are traveling the same speed, okay, even though the motions are different, there's more distance in this one. Yeah, hence, there's more time. Time slows down as you move through space. Because of this fact. That is mind-boggling, right? So, the faster you move through space, the slower time passes for you. Because of this, this is why time dilation happens. Okay? Because you're traveling more distance in the same time. And that's just depending on the curvature. 
here's gravity. Here's why gravity, gravitational, gravitational dilation happens, right? Why does time slow down near a black hole? It's the same thing. There's a deep relationship between space and time, right? Space and time are two of the same thing. They're two aspects of the same formation, the same structure. So here's a black hole, right? Imagine a black hole near this area. Now imagine apples traveling near it at the same speed. These are all traveling at the same speed. But the difference is that these apples here are experiencing more gravity, more curvature, right? See, the apple here near the black hole is experiencing more curvature. Hence, it has to travel more distance. The one here is the one apple where there's no curvature. It's traveling fine. The other one is, relatively speaking, traveling much slower versus the one on the on the outside. Does that make sense? The apple on the outside of the black hole is traveling faster, relatively speaking, toward the one for, towards the one that's closest to the black hole, because the one closest to the black hole is experiencing so much curvature of space time, it has to travel more distance. So relative to somebody on the outside, it looks like the apple near the black hole is stopped. It looks like the apple is in slow motion. And this is a real phenomenon that happens. This is real. If you were to look near a black hole and see an astronaut near it, they would look like slow motion to you relative to somebody on the Earth. Okay. So that is something, another strange phenomenon about reality. Your perception of time is greatly related to all these things, your velocity, your thing, your gravity. And that's mind boggling. Okay. Anyway, you guys can watch that video on my YouTube. I also talk about time and uh, how time is really seems to be something that's not fundamental to the universe. Oh, well, I'm sorry. Um, th our, the passage of time is, is not fundamental. How time passes is not fundamental. Are we being pulled in down onto Earth by its mass or pushed down by the pressure? No. Uh, well, technically both, but the gravity outweighs pressure. I mean... The pressure might have a, a force on us, you know, probably 0.5% that of the gravity that we're experiencing, right? So, um, it's not, it's going to be a negligible, negligible um, amount of uh, forcing. Why does light travel at a constant rate, even if there's a curvature? That's one of the biggest questions that we have that this is the one of the biggest mysteries of the universe why does light travel at a constant rate right um maybe cancel if he has an idea i don't think anybody does though i, I think that um it has to do with the structure of the universe itself it has to do with why the the, the different dimensions of space time there's not enough room for light to travel any faster but i don't know we don't know your brain's gonna burst <laughs> <laughs> yeah this is a lot of knowledge guys this is a this is like all this stuff i taught you today took me years to understand so if you don't get it don't feel bad about yourself guys uh this is mind-boggling stuff it took me years to understand all this so but I just wanted to give you some inspiration to do your own research and learn. Right? I want you to do your own inspir your own research and learn about everything I'm telling you. Learn. That's the key.